Okay. Hare Krishna, everybody. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Bo. Welcome to class number seven, Vedic Psychology. I have an announcement to start with for you guys. Um, due to frequent requests for more, Vedic Psychology classes are going to continue every Saturday at 7.30 India time. So I was saying this is the last class, but it's not. <laughs> but it's not. So just so you know, we, you don't have to get all of your questions in today. We're going to keep going, you know, as long as we can. Okay? The next thing is I, just a warning. Yeah. Just a warning I want to let you know is this class is not for children. So if any of you are listening with your kids, um, this can be really potentially triggering because I'm going to talk about child abuse in this class. And it also may be triggering to you as an adult if you've been abused as a child. So please take the necessary precautions that you need to protect yourself and, your, and the kids that you're taking care of. In other words, if you, if you get triggered, please feel free to leave the class if you need to or if you don't want to hear it. You know, if you want to listen to the recording later so you can pause it, you know, if it's too triggering, just do what you need to take care of you and also for your kids. They, they probably shouldn't hear this. You can listen to it first and if you think they can hear parts of the recording, that would be good, but just be careful, okay? So the outline today, there's our friend the cat and the mouse. <laughs> um, I'm gonna, we're going to do our sattvic second, sattvic second. Then I'm going to do something called 20 to attune. It's a practice. And then I'm going to review the main points from last week. Then I'm going to talk about the lasting effects of the unattuned mother. And then I'm going to talk about the importance of Vedic psychology. And then I'll open it up for questions. So sattvic second. You guys all know this one by now, right? To get clear, why are you here? Just take a minute to tune into yourself. Why are you here? What are you hoping to get out of this class today? Maybe your goals have changed over time. This is our seventh meeting. So maybe they're getting more specific. Or maybe you have something new that you are trying to get out of the class. Why are you here? What are you trying to do? What are you trying to get out of this time? If you haven't done so already, it might be a good idea to get a journal and write it down each week. So you can see over time what you're learning. You can check at the end of the class and see, did, did I get, reach my goal of what I was trying to learn? You know, it's interesting to see over time. OK, so everybody got in your head, why are you here? Everybody got it? So now I'm going to um, just point out here, it's the same reason you know, every week that I say, but I usually add something. So last week I said version 3.0, right? That you're here to learn about yourself, to change yourself by developing more compassionate empathy specifically. And we've been focusing on that for a few weeks. So I think you guys are doing a great job learning about what that is. Um, and the, the reason why is in order to clear out anything that is blocking your mind from advancing spiritually. So I added, the only new thing I added to this slide from last week is cognitive is thinking, just so you can see how this ties in. So if I'm saying, why are you here? Then you're thinking, OK, I'm here because, right? So that's a cognitive activity. Whereas the next activity, take 20 to a tune, is an affective activity, an activity for your heart from your heart, OK? Your feelings. So first, it's like, what are you thinking? And then how are you feeling, OK? So just take 20 seconds, that's all to attune to your heart and see how you're feeling. You've made some goal about why you're here. And now just take a 20 seconds to attune. If you can feel your heart, what are you feeling now? Try to come up with something. How do you feel in this moment? OK. Part of attunement is developing a feelings vocabulary. Oftentimes when I start with new clients, they say, I'm good. I, I feel good. I feel bad. Those aren't feelings, first of all. Um, and second of all, there's a lot. They're not feeling. Second of all, there's a lot broader range of things you can feel. So this is just a little sample that I'm putting here. You could feel happy right now. You could feel sad. You could feel annoyed or angry. You could feel excited or confused, embarrassed, tired, disappointed, shy, nervous. So many things you could feel. OK? So this is a nice uh, way to develop your feelings vocabulary. You can just type in feelings wheel or feelings vocabulary. And there's many things you can download off of Google and use that as your roadmap 
to actually get in touch with your heart, with your feelings, OK? So let's review the main points from last week. The first one was about ahankara antics, remember? The ahankara blocks our ability to perceive things clearly, especially our, our own flaws. You remember the skunk? So the skunk is spraying off this bad smell, but he doesn't realize it. He was so proud, you know? He doesn't realize that he's you know, spraying behind him up, you know, other people who are like, woo. So that's kind of how it is in life when our ahankara is blocking our ability not only to see ourselves, but to see how we affect other people. And that's why these clashes happen, because we can't empathize with the other person and how we've hurt them. So this causes us to see ourselves in a glorified way. This, I mean, our ahankara, such as thinking, oh, yeah, I have compassionate empathy. You know, I heard about that. That's me. That's totally me. The second point from last week was about the unattuned mother, right? I talked a lot about it, but I just pulled out two, two points. One is that to the extent that our mother did not attune to us as a child is to the extent that we cannot attune to others in our adult life. I'm not saying that that's fixed in stone. I'm saying if you don't do some work, you know, if you just, the mind unworked with, you know. But if, you're, if you see a psychotherapist who can help you see how you're not attuning, then you can definitely learn how to attune. So I think last week I didn't say that very clearly. You know? So what I'm saying is that it's it just raw. If your mother didn't attune to you as a child, you don't have a very good chance of attuning to other people as an adult, because that's how you learn it from your mom. She's your first guru. You know? But many of us have probably already been in therapy and worked on it. Um, and if not, it's a good idea to do that, so you can learn how to attune to others in your life and, and yourself, your inner child. The second point here is that we push away people who are kind to us if we didn't have a mother that was attuned to us. So if somebody is expressing compassionate empathy, we, our, our wires get crossed. It feels like suffocating or weird or like they're being fake or I don't trust that. I don't like that person. When really, actually, they're showing compassionate empathy. But we don't have a samskara for that that matches with that. It's not comfortable for us. So it's so foreign. It doesn't match how we are treated by our, by our mother. Okay. And the third point from last week was that compassionate empathy is the key to spiritual life. The most qualified students are those with compassionate empathy because they can relate to the characters' feelings and the stories. They can understand these more subtle points because there are points about the heart, about feelings. And then they can apply the concepts to change themselves for the better. <laughs> so those are the ideas from last week. OK, now I'm going to switch gears and talk about the lasting effects of the unattuned mother. Look at this picture, you guys. See how desperate the baby is for the mom's attention? She may be on a call just for 30 seconds. We don't know, you know? But she's just like, Mom, Mom, don't you see me? You know, don't you? And none of us can remember. Most of us probably can't remember that age, how our mother was with us. But the one way you can tell is by how you behave as an adult, you know? When somebody doesn't pay attention to you, when somebody doesn't see you, when you feel ignored or invalidated, you know? So that baby is just desperate for her mom to attune. So it's not so easy to operate from a place of compassion and empathy. A lot of people have been asking you, like, well, can, can you teach that? Or can I learn how to do that? We can, we can learn, definitely, you know? And that's what we're here to do, but it's not easy. You know? So we want to be gentle with ourselves. If you weren't taught that, if you weren't attuned to in those first few months of life is what we're talking about. That means you've lived your whole life, however old you are, reinforcing a samskara, a program of unattunement. So we have to go against 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years of conditioning. So we want to be very gentle with ourselves to learn how to do it, you know? So, so why is that? Because we don't know what compassionate empathy is. So we get fooled by things that mimic it, OK? So the reason why it's not easy to practice is because we don't know what it is. And then when people do things that are not compassionate empathy, we think it is. And then when people do things that are compassionate empathy, we think it isn't. So we get fooled by people who cover their unattuned heart with a most disingenuous <coughs> mask. That causes us to mistake their fake words and feelings for real ones. Look at this picture. <laughs> Chasing the carrot, you know? They say and do things that our unattuned mother never said or did. And it feels so amazing to be <coughs> loved, quote unquote, loved like that. So we get hooked by them. We open our heart. We give them our time. We give them our money. 
we give them our love and our undying loyalty. We're like fiercely loyal to these people, you know? But what do we get? Unfortunately, there are words and actions that are they're not sincere. <coughs> and eventually we'll realize that they're just deceiving and manipulating us to get what they want from us. They're sweet words, they don't last long. And when their true cold heart gets revealed, it hurts us, you know, very deeply. We come up empty again, you know. We get nothing but a broken heart again. I, again, I mean, the original broken heart was from our relationship with our mother. So we feel betrayed, we feel unloved and dismissed by them, just the way our mother made us feel as children when she did not attune to us. So what does that impel us to do? Do you see this guy? He's put a string around this lady. He's like wrapped her so she can't get away, right? So instead of distancing ourselves from somebody who's hurt, hurt us, if we had a mother that was unattuned to us, we actually come closer to them in an attempt to get love, not from them, even though it seems like them, but from the mother that never gave it to us. And that's actually the story of many people's relationships in, in adulthood that we don't see. You know, this is coming from a, many years for me of seeing this in people. So I'm telling you some of the, the nuggets of what I learn when I work with couples, when I work with people in relationship struggles, you know? It's that you're trying to get love from somebody or get attention from somebody that can't give it to you. It's just not possible, otherwise they would, you know? And you're doing like acrobatics to get it. You're killing yourself, you know? Like you're giving them too much money, money you don't even have. Or you're, maybe you have sex with them and you, you don't want to. You're giving them your body. You're giving them your mind. You're giving them your time. You're giving them your things. Maybe you'd even move somewhere for them. You, you do anything for them. But it's not because you have some special bond with them. It's actually because they make you feel that such painful way that the mother made you feel, you know? And you are trying, like, anything to get it, that love from this person because you never could get it from mom. And that chapter's closed now. Either mom has passed away or mom lives in a different place. You know, you're an adult, you're living somewhere else. Like, you can't get it from mom. So this samskara causes you to try to get it from somebody who's definitely not mom, but you don't see that. So you're hanging on tighter. One analogy I often use with my clients is I say, it's like holding onto a rose, and at first you're like, oh my god, that smells so good, right? But then the rose, like when it starts wilting and molding or rotting, you hold tighter onto the thorns, and blood is like dripping off your hand, and you're holding it tighter like razor blades are cutting into your fingers and the blood is dripping down but you're holding it tighter and the rose is dead and rotten. It's like the bad part of the rose now, you know? So this is the problem with some scars if you can't see them. Does that make sense? Okay. So here are some signs of a toxic relationship. Number one is you feel unsupported. Number two is toxic communication, which is kind of weird because it's a toxic relationship, so we shouldn't use the word toxic communication because then what, the, what does that mean? But basically, communication that's where the other person, one main thing is the other person never takes responsibility. Like, you're like, you know, when you said that or when you did that, that hurt me. And they're like, not my problem. That's you. That's it's your some scar. It's how you're. But you're like, oh, I thought we were friends or I thought you're my partner. I thought you cared, you know? Well, I do, but. You're just making that up in your head. I didn't do that, or I didn't say that, or you figure it out. So it's, you can't really get anywhere with somebody who doesn't take responsibility for their part. And that's the number one thing I work on with couples. Both, both people will come in, and they're blaming the other one, and neither one has any fault. <laughs> no, neither one did anything wrong. It's all the things the other person did. I even do it with friends sometimes. I do sessions with friends, too. You know, It's very hard to take responsibility for your part of it because you can't see it. You're not trying to be a jerk. You just can't see it, actually. You know, So that's toxic communication. Distrust is another sign of a toxic relationship where you don't trust the person. Disrespect is another one where somebody's controlling you, right? You, you're feeling controlled by the other person. You can't do this, and you can't go here, and you can't go there, and you have to call me at this time. And you can't, when you feel like you just really can't be yourself, that's also toxic. When you feel like you're walking in eggshells, like, uh, uh, I better not say that because I'm going to piss her off or piss, I'm going to upset him or her. I just have to be like, I'll just agree to it. It's easier to agree to doing that thing than to upset the person. Have you ever done that? I used to always do that, you know? So that's walking in eggshells, you know? Um, or you feel that your needs or your feelings are being neglected. Now, I want to say the tricky thing, just put an asterisk by all of these. The tricky thing about this is, you may feel all these things, and they may not actually be happening. 
That's the other weird part. You have to work with a professional who can help you see how much of this is you and your samskaras, and how much of this is them. That's, this is why it's, the mind is so tricky, really. You know? And oftentimes, if, if you're the therapist, then I've told you guys this before, but then all this gets projected onto me. And I'm like, all right, you've hired me to help you. Now you don't trust me. Now you, you know, you're doing all this stuff to me. So I can see how you are in relationships, because you're doing it all to me, too. And then I have to point it out. And if you're courageous enough to listen, you can get through it and work through it with me. You know? Or some therapist you work with. They'll help you see this transference you're doing under the therapist. You know? But the main point is, it's not so easy. Because what, what, what could be dangerous is that you hear this, and you go back to your friend, your partner, your, your relative, whoever, and you're like, you, you're doing all these things to me. And it's like, well, <laughs> so I don't want to misuse and abuse what you're learning in Vedic psychology. We can get dangerous really fast, because this information is really powerful. So we don't want to take it out of context. I would work with a professional and make sure that you're clear if you're like, I feel like, is this true that my, neglects, my needs are being neglected? Sometimes I'm like, have you even mentioned your needs? That would be nice. <laughs> you know, you got to mention your needs. you got to stand up for yourself. You can't be a passive victim. That's why I'm saying for each of these, we have to be very careful that you, cl that you have a stamp of approval by some professional saying, yes, that sounds toxic. Let's talk through it with the other person, OK? This is a very fascinating, at least to me. I hope you guys find it interesting. But I found some research that talks about the biological reason why we stay in abusive relationships. So up until now, one common fact that a lot of people probably have heard or know a lot in the world of therapy is that it takes a, a woman who's been abused by her husband seven attempts to leave him before she can successfully leave. So I have a lot, you know, if I have a client who's being abused by her husband, I try to explain, OK, let's research abuse, understand this and that and the other. But they say, yes, I got it. And they try to leave. Two days later, they're back. You know, he gives her some roses or some chocolates, or he says some sweet words, and, and she's back. And by the seventh attempt, finally, she can break away and stay away, if, unfortunately, he doesn't kill her. That happens, actually. That's the most dangerous time if you're an abused woman to leave your partner. Because oftentimes, if it's that abusive, they can try to kill you. So anyway, but the point is that it's, we are hardwired to attach to our mother no, mat no matter how badly she treats us. Now, that's amazing to me. We, there's a hardwiring. So here's some of the main points. So number one is that children have a biologically predetermined attachment system in our, we have it in our brain as babies when we're born, and what's, which we must learn to identify and remember the caregiver, OK? So what the baby's doing at the very beginning is they're, even in the womb, actually, before they come out, they're listening to the sounds of the mother's voice, right? And then when they come out, they're feeling the touch of the mother, the smell. They can't even see yet. How does the mother smell? And they're learning everything specific about their mother. All of us did that, you know? And so we are bonded, you know, for life to our mother based on her very specific smell and touch and you know everything about that we can get with our senses to mom okay the second point is that there's a brain chemical called norepinephrine it's a neurotransmitter in our brain that releases actually a massive amounts of of this chemical at birth so when we come out when we're first born it's a bonding chemical so we bond right onto mom with that you know during birth and during like the, the, the beginning little bit of our life. This chemical is making us bond. That's the power of the, the brain, you know, the brain, the brain chemistry. It's beyond like, you know, talking about it. You know, like in other words, like in talk therapy, you can talk about it. But if the brain chemistry is making this happen, it's like, wow, at a biological level. The third point is that the ability to bond with a caregiver is such a strong biological imperative that once the bond is formed, even with an abuser, it is extremely difficult to break it. And once a newborn knows its mother, like by the smell and the touch, like I described, once the newborn knows the mom, which is very quick, it's in a very, like a week or two, you know, all of a sudden they know their mom, then it will do its best to remain bonded to that mother no matter what. And that's also a samskara, and that is with us for life. That is one of the very first programs we get. So you see why Baba Joy says mother's the first guru, that's, and she's like thousands of times more important than the father. That's one of the reasons why. You know, 
we bond to her so strongly. No matter what she's doing, we have no ability to judge. It's just a biological process. So to ensure that this mother-child bond occurs, the mother's presence is a biological off switch for fear. This gave me chills, you guys, when I was researching this. It gave me chills to, when I heard that. Because, you know, the baby's so innocent, right? And if, imagine the mother's abusing the baby, which I, I told you guys I used to work in a psychological, you know, psychiatric hospital for kids that were abused. And those kids, you know, they would always defend their mother. Not one of them complained about their mother. And the mothers were so abusive that they were taken out of the custody. That's why they live at the hospital, you know? So what happens to the child is, when the child is in the mother's presence, all fear goes away. Biologically, just fear switches off. Uh, baby. Baby. <laughs> um, it's not a discussion right now? OK. So the mother's presence is a biological off switch for fear, OK? This mechanism causes us to not feel fear or stress when we're with our mother. I'm not saying for life, but at the beginning, when we need her desperately for our survival, OK? So it's when, when the child is in the presence of the mother, they just relax. And they, they've done studies on this to prove it. So th here's the benefits of that. When the child is near the mother, for example, if the child has to go to the doctor and get an injection, you know how that is, a vaccine, you know, they, they actually have studied that the stress hormones go down, way down, if their mom's holding them and comforting them. Even if the mom abuses them, pinching their leg or is abusing them, they, st they actually don't get stressed from that or feel for from, fearful from that. So um, here's the downsides of the maternal off switch. When the mother herself is the source of the danger, you see this little kid has been punched in the eye, the suppression of the fear circuits in the brain, it still works, OK? So there's circuits in your brain that alert fear, 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 danger, you know? Bear chasing you in the woods, run. Doesn't, doesn't get triggered for the kid. It gets suppressed when she's with the mom. And that's because of this important need for attachment to the mother. Because if you don't have the mother, how are you going to live? So the fear, avoidance, and even memories associated with pain, they're extinguished. So even if you had some fear, imagine you had some fear about what happened, it, it, it actually, you forget it. So oftentimes when I'm working with people, and their mother was abusive to them, when we get to that point in the therapy, they say, I don't have any memories. Or they'll say, my mom was great. My mom was great. Yeah. Or they'll say, I mean, what she did, and let me describe what she did. She was young, or she, whatever. There's always a good reason for what she did, you know? And um, this, is, this is the reason why now. I've always known this, but I didn't know the reason why. And so finding this helped me understand, like, biologically why. I understand Vedic psychology, samskara why, reason why, you know, but this was like, whoa, it's even proven by Western, you know, science. So it's like we don't have a fighting chance. <laughs> We've got a samskara that makes us act a certain way, and then the biology, you know, reinforces that, or vice versa. But, so this, is, this explains why an abused child, even while trying to escape the pain, she'll later seek contact with the abuser. So even if she's trying to run away, just if, if the mom was going to abuse her, she'll come back to her and want to snuggle with her. Because the memories get extinguished. You forget them or you rationalize in some way. She was just having a hard time. She was just having a hard day, you know? She works two jobs. And I'm like, so you deserve the abuse? Yes. I did. I, I shouldn't have asked for dinner. Well, actually, it's her job to give you dinner. So the same is true for us as adults. We repeat the same pattern in our adult relationships with abusive people. And that's the, the hard part. That's the, I know a lot of this is really heavy and hard to hear. But that's what's going on. That's what the whole point of samskara is. That's the whole reason why we focus on samskaras in Vedic psychology. Because we're doing the same thing, but we don't see it. You know? And we didn't see that as a kid, of course, as a child, as a baby. And we don't see it as an adult. And then when someone points it out, that's why Babaji said the ahankara is so sensitive. Because when we point it out, it's like, my mother was fine. My mother was great, actually. We're good friends. It's like, OK. So it's really hard to see. 
So I just want to point out a few things about abuse. Since we're on the topic, it's important. Some of you may not even know that you were abused because it's not only physical, that's the one obvious one, right? But there's a lot of emotional abuse that happens by mothers and fathers. So one of the points is that the effects of early childhood abuse can be very, very difficult to detect. If you have any children in your family or if you were, when you were a child, if you were abused, um, it's difficult to identify an abused child unless there's very obvious signs like bruises or some sort of injuries. <coughs> Even when therapists, doctors, or police officers attempt to rescue a child from an abusive situation, the child will lie to protect the parents. I had so many cases where I had to you know, actually go to the child's home you know, and talk to the parents and, and the child would have, art. they would have told me in session, they would have revealed a little bit. So then I go to the parent and the child's like, no, I didn't, I didn't say that, that didn't happen. So it's really hard, you know. Children will lie to protect their parents. Um, and children often, you know, like I said, defend their abuser, but so do we as adults. If we didn't do that and we could have this magical power even for one day to see all of our samskaras, therapy could be like very quick. <laughs> the therapeutic process. But I have some people I've been seeing for six years or longer because it's a very difficult process to go back and look at that samskara and then deal with it and you have to go through the process of really seeing your parents for who they were and how they did not show up for you. You know, even, even for example, if your parents never hit you, if they ignore you, you know, if they leave you at home alone, there's so many things that are considered abusive, you know, so it's, it's a big study to understand the ways in which you were not attuned to. It takes a skilled therapist to help the client see and accept their abuse. What we can learn from monkeys, okay? <laughs> we're in Vrindavan, right? So what we can learn from monkeys. Monkeys choose real love over fake love, okay? Monkeys would rather have a snuggly mother with no food, that combination, okay, than a mother who has food and a cold heart. So look at the picture. Can you see this picture, you guys? See the baby monkey on the cloth? This is a very famous uh, research study where they put two wire net things there. Neither of them are real mother, but one of them they put a snuggly cloth and like a face, a fake face, not even a real one, right? It looks like a plastic face. It looks like a mother. And then the other one, they put the food. See on the, the snuggly one, there's no bottle. These are tiny babies. And then on the other one, they put a bottle full of milk. And no babies chose that one. They would rather starve to death on the snuggly one than get, than get the food. So this is the power of true love. That's what we're all here for. Why are we in bhakti yoga? You know, what are we doing here? We all want that. But first we have to see how we didn't get that. How we didn't get that and how that's probably causing us to act in ways that are, make, that are blocking us from actually going forward spiritually with what we want. So that's a very powerful, famous study, you know? And, and how does this relate to, to our life? We often choose the people who are giving us fake love. Why? Because our mother didn't give us real love. So we have to get really clear on, I'm not even, talk, I'm not even talking about bhakti love, I'm talking about just material, what is love? What is a healthy relationship? What is attunement? We have to learn that first before we can move forward. Otherwise our foundation is very shaky. Okay, so here's the importance of Vedic psychology. Based on all that, you probably already know, that's why you're here. But I want to reiterate it because Babaji gave me some things he wanted me to tell you today. One is that Vedic psychology is not to study what you're doing. It is to study where is your chitta. The important thing is to study your chitta. That is a hard job and also people don't like it. You start talking about their chitta and they become disturbed. This is the deepest study of human beings or human life. There's nothing deeper than this. This is the essence of everything. The mind or the manas just is reflecting what's in your chitta. In future weeks, I'm gonna teach you about the parts of the mind so you can understand actually what, even physically what this looks like, you know? But for now, that's an that's import, important concept. And the chitta, what's in the chitta is our samskara. That's what he means when he's saying study the chitta. Study these samskaras that are hidden and that are driving us to go after things that are not love. So clean the chitta. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, clean the chitta. He did not say to clean the mind, and that only bhakti does. 
When chitta is clean, then naturally mind is clean because mind is just a reflection of what's in chitta. Okay? So Vedic psychology is a secret weapon for cleaning the chitta. Many people are confused, like, oh, Vedic psychology is not really part of bhakti yoga. You know, you have to do Vedic psychology, that's its own separate ugly stepchild, and then bhakti is its own thing. You know, so a lot of people who practice bhakti yoga are not here today, you know, because they only want to come and hear Bhagavatam or Bhagavad Gita. They don't think that, ve that Vedic psychology is part of it, or they don't think that they need it. But that's, you have to have it, you have to have it, and you have to do it before you can even do the other stuff. So here's what Babaji said. Vedic psychology is a part of bhakti yoga. It is not separate. In fact, Vedic psychology originates from the concepts Krishna teaches in the Bhagavad Gita, one of the main scriptures that the path of bhakti yoga is built upon. And Sri Krishna is the very first psychologist who eloquently teaches the concepts that we are using today in Vedic psychology to analyze the human mind. That is why I'm so adamant that all of my students seriously study and apply the concepts of Vedic psychology in their life. So the study of the human mind. These are little seeds turning into sprouts, like a time-lapsed picture. So the mind is where thoughts, desires, and emotions manifest. Chitta is where the samskaras are lying, which is the source of these things. Chitta is like the seed, and mind is like the sprout. When the seed is there, you don't see. When the sprout is there, it is visible, so you can recognize it. But you have to know the seeds. That is the study. If you want to know what is in your chitta, which is your samskaras, you start from studying your mind. OK? So you can see how the seeds, right, those seeds underground, the first four lim images, they're underground. And above ground is what we can see. Then when those things start sprouting up, that's when it's bad. That's when you're already like having some very big trigger. You know, that's when maybe you're like um, very angry at someone or very sad about something or very worried or anxious or jealous when something's really manifesting strongly. But at that point, you still don't realize it's a samskara. And so wh whoever it's manifesting onto, that's what the problem is. Dauji, you're the problem, <laughs> you know? So you don't realize it's actually something that's in you, that's been in you all along, and now it's coming up but it's getting reflected onto whoever you're engaging with, and you think it's them. That's why a lot of people don't like or have s trouble doing japa, or don't like being by themselves, because they feel lonely, and actually what's happening is you're seeing your samskaras. All your samskaras are coming up, you know? So that's why it's very, very tricky, because we don't realize what's, what's in there. And that there's a way you can start, you know, you can start by getting a journal, starting when you're doing japa or when you're by yourself or when you're triggered by some person, you can write about your feelings. Get a feelings wheel, like I showed you, or a feelings chart, and write what feelings are coming up. And even if you just do it for one week, look back on the week and you can already start seeing what is the theme. Ooh, I've been anxious all week long. I had no idea, actually. One of my clients, and I just discovered that this week, he realized he's been anxious and he's waking up five out of 10 anxiety every day and he didn't know it. But once he realized, he used the feelings wheel and he just wrote down every time he wasn't feeling peaceful. And he's like, shoot, it's anxious again. I'm anxious again. I'm anxious again. I'm anxious again. And all these different scenarios. <clears throat> so that's a way to get a, a hint of the scent kind of of the samskara. Because the samskara is below, but, just, but there's some aroma coming up. And the aroma from the samskara is the feeling in the present moment. So that's one way to start tracking back to what the samskara is, the first step, I would say. You know, does that make sense? OK. So how can you study your mind on your own with the very mind that's troubling you? You've probably heard of this before, right? It's so tricky. You know, so that's why I just gave you a, a hint on how to start. But it's very tricky. That's why it's like, where do I start with all this? Because what I really want to do is just write down, or I want to tell that person, listen, if you could just change in this way, things would be so much better. Right? It's how we want to tell the other person they need to change so they don't trigger and disturb me. So instead, we have to study our mind. And, and by doing that, I mean study what feelings are coming up at the superficial level of the manas. You know, you're not going to get into the chitta and figure that out. But try, try with the manas. Just what are the feelings in the moment? And maybe why? Like, what triggered them? OK? But only a person with an unclean mind would think it's a great idea to study my own chitta, my own samskaras, you know? 
with a dirty mind. That's like putting on these dirty, muddy glasses, you know, and thinking, oh, I can see clearly, you know. It's hard to say. I'm trying to give analogies because it's really hard to explain, explain it. But as we work together over time, I'll start showing you more and more about the mind, and you'll see what I mean. And I'll give you exercises like I just gave you to practice over the week so you can get a better idea of what I'm talking about. So distorted perception. So basically, our ahankara and our samskaras cause us to be able to not perceive things as they actually are. So you, you perceive things in an inaccurate or a distorted manner because they're just based on whatever your past experiences are. That's how you're going to see things. It's amazing if you put a bunch of people in a room and you ask them something, they're all going to have a different perception, even of what happened. Just say a fight broke out between two people, but there was eight people watching. Every of the eight person would say something different. I, that was good that she did that. You know, I'm glad she, you know, and the other person said, no, we shouldn't fight. And the other person would say, she's wrong. No, she's wrong. It's all through your own scar that you're seeing it. You know, so it's not clear. And that's seeing other people. But imagine how you could even see yourself then. It's even more distorted, you know? So um, trying to be an expert of your own mind, the analogy that I use is like trying to do open heart surgery on yourself. You know, nobody thinks that they could do that, right? I researched it because I thought one of you guys would probably try to prove me wrong. There's one guy who did a surgery on himself that was a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> but not open heart, okay? He did it like in his abdomen a long time ago, and there's the pictures on, you can Google it, you can see, but there's pictures of him literally conscious and like doing surgery in his abdomen, and it's open and everything, but um, not his heart, okay? So I'm talking about open heart surgery, which is your chitta, doing your own open heart surgery. That's ludicrous to try to think you, you can do that, but I think most people think they can. They're like, I know my mind, and I've done this and this and this type of other type of therapy, you know, and I can, so I, I, I've got it figured out, you know. But it's not, it doesn't make sense to try to do your own open heart surgery. So that's the same idea of the, the very delicate and precise work required to identify a samskara and see how it's playing out in your life. You can't do it on your own. You need a psychology professional to help, to help you study your mind. And you have to trust that person, you know, and that's hard because we have samskaras of broken trust by who? our mother. And the psychologist is going to come in and play that role, hopefully, of a nurturing mother, somebody who's going to care for you and support you. And it's going to be very hard to trust somebody like that because of our past. So our ahankara creates, so you remember I was saying qualities of ahankara. One of them is rationalization. We rationalize everything, you know? Even if one day you just watched yourself and wrote down every time you're like, you think you might be rationalizing, maybe you won't catch any, but it's very funny once you, under, once you see that quality, because we do it all day long for everything. You know, I'll just have one more of this, or I don't need to do that because of this, or I'll, it's like all day long our hankar rationalizes our behavior. Um, so it, it creates a tendency for us to resist psychotherapy and to actually prefer and promote alternative therapies. I don't know if you notice your hankar doing that, but I have so many people who, by the time they've come to me, they've tried everything under the sun because they don't want to do psychotherapy. And then on top of that, once we're in psychotherapy and we discover, okay, you actually have depression, you know, or you actually have anxiety, or you have something that needs a chemicals, a chemical imbalance, and so you need to take medication. Oh, I, I mean, I'll talk to you, but I will not take Western medicine. Okay. So then there's a whole thing against that too. You know, the ahankara is like really against you know, oftentimes Western medicine and psychotherapy. Those things are like, no. So I'll try like, you know, anything other than taking medication and seeing a therapist. I can understand, it's, it's scary. It's actually scary to, you know, humble yourself down, to listen to an expert tell you about your own mind, which we all think we know. Here's Babaji's viewpoint on this. He has a long quote and a lot to say. I have tried all kinds of healing modalities myself, from energy healing to hypnotherapy to Vedic astrology to past life regressions to Akashic record readings to sound therapy to acupuncture to tantra to agori techniques and too many others to count. <laughs> For years, I have been curious to see if anything can come close to the healing power of Vedic psychology. After 30 years, I can say with confidence that I have not experienced another treatment modality besides Vedic psychology that is as effective at treating the root cause of the problem. The alternative treatments I've experienced are just working at treating the symptoms. There is a place for that, and they are helpful for a temporary relief. But they are only chopping off the sprout and not touching the seed. 
These methods only give temporary relief to the mind. The only method that works to clear the toxic seed in our heart once and for all is Vedic psychology. It is not possible to see your own samskaras clearly. Therefore, it is compulsory for any serious practitioner on the path of bhakti yoga to work with a trained psychologist to help you see what you need to change. It takes a big investment of time and money, a humble ego, and a lot of courage to endure the emotional pain associated with the Vedic psychology cleansing process. But it is the only way to do it. Unfortunately, most people look for a cheap workaround, and that is why they're not progressing on the path of bhakti yoga. So Babaji doesn't mince his words. Other treatment modalities are just cutting the grass. You guys have heard him say that all the time, right? The grass will grow back. It's like mopping the floor. You, can you see the white streak there? You see how clean you can make a floor? Right, exactly. And then look. But underneath the perfectly clean floor is the dirty, cluttered basement. That's, the, that's your chitta, OK? This, this is manas. This is manas. Manas is the mind where all the samskara feelings and thoughts get projected onto manas, right? And so you can mop the floor. You can clean it up. You can do some breathing techniques or whatever thing you can in the moment. I mean, I use essential oils all the time for that. It's, I'm not saying that those treatment modalities aren't extremely helpful in the moment. If you are triggered, yes, use some essential oils, you know, do some breathing. But it's like mopping the floor. How long is it going to stay clean? Those feelings are going to come again. Because underneath, this is where the feelings are coming from. Do you see the stinky trash? Those smells are emanating up and making the floor dirty. This is the analogy. You got it? So underneath this perfectly clean floor of your manas that you've mopped clean with alternative you know, methods is a very dirty, cluttered basement full of some scars that you don't see and you don't want to see. But that's the only way out. You have to see them and you have to work with them, digest them to get out of them. Or another analogy would be that you're hosting your guests in your sattvic living room. You see how beautiful that is? <laughs> Clean, organized, little clutter. But look, and hiding behind closed doors is your tamasic bedroom. Same idea. This is manas, and you can work you know, to keep it nice and clean. You can do lots of techniques for that. But you're, you're only cutting the grass. The, this will get messy again, and this is where it's coming from. You're hiding stuff in your basement that you don't even realize. And that's the chitta. Those are the samskaras that have to be addressed to work through so then manas can be clean once and for all permanently. OK? OK, so today I'm leaving time for questions. I know I, I haven't given time in a lot of the classes, so I wanted to leave time today for you guys. You can ask anything about what I've shared today or in the past. I know there's some classes I didn't have time at all for questions. So I know it was a heavy lecture, a lot of heavy points. Welcome to the world of Vedic psychology. <laughs> Rati? Um, is it on? That's working? Yeah. Um, so, you're saying in the last few slides that it requires a trained psychotherapist to work through sangskaras. I guess that's not always practical and possible, right? Especially given that there are, it seems like the, the stockpile of sangskaras is endless, more or less. And if you were just constantly running to a psychotherapist constantly, I mean, then would you grade the level of it according to how much it's disturbing the mind coming into the manas? Some things can be dealt with individually by ourselves with, with some method, or are you, yeah, you, you understand my question? So your question is, we have endless samskaras, and so it kind of sounds like I'm saying you should, you're going to have to be in therapy the rest of your yeah, life or something, exactly. like, you know, because there's so many samskaras <laughs> we have to work through. And then your question is, like, isn't there some way we could, like, work through some on our own? Yes. Yeah, okay. That's right. I got it. I know. It, that's why I, I know it feels very overwhelming, probably, everything I shared. So um, actually, samskaras, you know, they're not all troubling. And a lot of them are in the same categories. That's why I'm trying to teach you guys the root already. The root is the unattuned mother. And once you know, OK, you've got an unattuned mother, most likely, and then some, some issue with father. Those are the two main issues. And once you get those categories, there's not so much to work through. 
It's not that, because if you look at it like every single samskara, there could be thousands of every time your mom didn't attune. But if you got the basic general concept, like the thesis statement, my mother wasn't attuned, once you heal a few of those, once you work through a few, then the rest clear up. And same thing with, okay, what way was your father not there? Was he not there at all? Was he overly critical? Was he, you figure out the way and how he hurt you, and then you don't have to clear every single individual samskara. I work with people on samskara categories, and then we clear a few in the category. So it's not as overwhelming, you know? And a lot of it is nurturing your inner child. So if you can find a psychotherapist who specializes in that, that's the goal. Because a lot of psychotherapists will stay right at the cutting the grass level, too. It's not that all psychotherapy goes to the root. So you want to find one who works with nurturing the inner child, because our, our core issue has to do with attachment with mother and probably some issue with father. Those are the core ones we want to work on. So even if they've never heard of the word samskara, that's OK. You know, you just find somebody who can work at the level of the inner child and clear those things up. Does that make sense? Does that feel better? Or? OK, a good question. Yes, Narottam. So my question is a follow-up to what has been just asked, and I also want to build on it. So what are the criteria which help us understand that a particular therapist is good enough to help us go through this journey? And yeah, so this is the first one. Uh, working with the inner child. They have to be an expert in working with the inner child and attachment theory. Okay, and then sometimes when we come to a session, they ask us, so how are we doing? What do you want to work on? Inner and child. I, and I, I, <laughs> well, yeah, but, uh, w w without a particular problem. For, for instance, sometimes some, there are some weeks when I can clearly see an issue that I would like to work on. But sometimes I'm, a, I'm in a good mood and I just have a o already booked slot and I come and I don't really have any particular issue. So how, wh what's the system? Uh, sometimes it's just, uh, you just don't see the end and you don't know where to go. So what I would do is I would have a list of what your samskaras are, or like at least try to think, we've get, you can re-listen to these lectures, but I've talked a lot about the unattuned mother. So maybe something hit you in a way that's like, oh, my mom kind of was like that. If not, research more about an unattuned mother and the effects. Research the effects of attachment style. Write down yourself, you know? And then be prepared to go to the session with a specific question trying to work on that specific issue. And the way you know the issue is done is when you get a relief. But oftentimes, we are in denial. We're, we, Thomas comes in and just puts dirt over our issues for the week. So we're like, I'm good. But you're probably not good. It's just that you've done the normal thing that you're conditioned to do, which is avoid your pain. You know? So I would always come in advance. I wouldn't rely on the therapist to direct the session. I, like, so it's a good question. How, should I, how can I direct it? Come with your samskara. Come with the issue. And talk about your inner child. And if you stay in tune with your feelings over the week, there will always be an issue. None of us are completely sattvic all week long. So whatever that issue is, you know, if you're staying in touch with your feelings, then I would bring those. And I'd say, I want to work on my inner child. Here, here's the feelings I had. Even if you don't know the specific samskara, here, here are the feelings that I had this week. And the theme was, you could save a lot of time and a lot of therapy sessions if you can come with what your feelings were for the week and the theme. I love it when my clients do that. Otherwise, they're, you know, I'm, I'm having to do all the work for them. You know, does that help? Absolutely. Okay, good. Yes, Vila. So, Braja Vinodini is writing in the chat. Oh, okay. And she asks, how do you reconcile past life samskaras? There's so much emphasis on the relationship with the mother in this lifetime. And what do we do if we cannot afford psychotherapy? You can find free resources in your community or even in India. There, it's very, uh, you can search on, because now people do it on Zoom. You could probably find an Indian psychotherapist if you're living in the US, you know, and get a very good price for that. I, you can search that. Um, that is one of the questions I get all the time. That's a sign, if you're asking about past life, that you're in a big denial about what happened in this life, I'm sorry to say. Because everybody has major issues from this life. But another way that we avoid is we talk about past life. So whatever happened in your past life happened, but you have so many things that happened in this life that you're in denial about, work on that first. You know? And what determined this life is our past life. So it's the same stuff. It's the same issues. Whatever we didn't work through, you know, whether it was 10 lifetimes ago or now. But I've never seen a person who had such an amazing connection with their mother that they have no issues with their mother or father. And so we're going to work on past life stuff. It doesn't even make sense. So those kind of questions are just a very big denial of any past life questions, the big denial of what happened in this life that you need to heal. 
Okay. Shailesh? He wrote it or he's going to? Oh. Haribo <laughs> Shailesh. Um, I have a question about this episode, which was discussed in the previous um, session. Um, okay. Sessions about the two sisters fighting in the back. Okay. Um, uh, I remember when when I had a consul consultation with you regarding my my son, that was a few years back, mm -hmm. and. Uh, I remember you, you were mentioning that once a, once a kid gets physical, like hits another kid or, or, or bruises him, whatever that is, then uh, the parent should act immediately, like uh, giving him some, some, you know, like a pun immediate punishment, like for instance, put in his room, you know, so that he just uh, Immediately gets uh, an understanding or impression that this is this is wrong. This this cannot be done. Whereas in that episode, uh, I th I think you were mentioning that um, uh, first we have to acknowledge the feelings of, of the child, and then when he is ready to listen us, uh, when he's calmed down, then we explain to him that this is wrong, that hitting your sister is wrong. So both to me make sense, but how to properly? I mean put them in harmony. Yeah, that's a good question, because it sounds like two conflicting things, right? It sounds yeah, like two of. different, yeah. Thanks. OK. So if, um, I think, if I remember correctly, your son hit somebody, right? He, he pushed he pushed, uh, he pushed he, another girl. He pushed a girl. Just while playing, playing in the backyard. He pushed a girl. But OK, so in that case, you have to immediately remove him and say, that's not OK, you know? But in this case, my sister and I, we were like pulling each other's hair. It's not like I was, she was asleep and I was beating her. We were actively in a, you know, we're, we were the same size and we were doing it to each other. It's not that she was standing there and I went over and pushed her, first of all. So he had to, to break it up and that is the right idea. You break it up immediately, you know. But then he, so the first point is break it up immediately. The second point is, you, he, I mean, he wanted to leave me on the side of the road, which he did, right? So instead, the, the idea would be to say, okay, that's not okay. It is important to say, that's not okay. You shouldn't pull your sister's hair. And then to say, you can, then he can process the feelings of how he felt too. That made me feel very angry. I was distracted. I was, driving, I was trying to drive the car, and you guys were doing that in the back, you know? And it made me feel so angry I wanted to leave you on the side of the road, but I'm not going to do that, you know? And you must have been feeling very angry at your sister. You know, so, and then when she comes down, she can hear it. So if you contrast that with your son, I would immediately pull him away because that's, you know, we don't want him to be pushing the girl. And if he was, is, gets really angry and has a meltdown, you can't really explain much to him then, right? And so you can try to calm his feelings down and then try to give him the, the advice. So I guess my point is, is this is an art. It's an art. You have to operate from some general guidelines, but it's not like, okay, so Joshika said, every time that this happens, I should always do this, this, and this. It's not, that, that's a cognitive understanding, you know? But I'm trying to say that it's both. You have to understand intellectually, cognitively, kind of what the strategy is, and then you have to also operate from your heart. So sometimes mm -hmm. it's gonna be confusing when I'm giving advice, if you're like, but wait, you said this and this, so it's good you're asking for clarification, but you can tell my answer is also still a little messy. <laughs> Because the strategy is you never want the child to be harming another child or to be in harm, harm's way themselves. But you also want them to feel loved, and you also want them to understand kind of what some basic rules are. So all that has to come together, and it's a little bit of an art how you do it. So I'm sorry my answer is not 100% clear, Shailesh, but I think the advice I gave you probably was when I heard the whole context of that story, I, I said it for that reason. And when I'm telling my, the sister, story of my sister, I was saying it for that, for a different context and a different reason. But all those elements were there. They may have come in a different order for a different reason. So that's why it's a little hard to learn how to do it. It's not, it's not like one, two, three, you know, so simple. No, I think, I think your answer is, 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 is practical. I mean, since I have a, I have a kid, this, so <laughs> these situations are very different and, and there are different episodes, so there should be some flexibility in, and making a decision, so, yeah. yeah. OK, thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Anything else? Kanta.
Yeah, I, I was just thinking, uh, okay, when we re uh, understand our samskaras, it can, like, it's logical that uh, we understand the samskaras from childhood and then we uh, trying to change it in our life. But what happened uh, with the relationship also with the mother uh, that we understand our samskaras, so after understanding them, we have some maybe resentment to the mother, or maybe some harsh feelings. So uh, all of this like creates some maybe like bad relationships, maybe like bad communication. I don't know something wrong in between relationship with the mother. So. Uh, yeah, I, I, I was hearing like we should understand what is there, then accept her, like uh, we cannot change them, all of this. I, that's what I was hearing. And if it's like this, I don't really understand what does it mean accept, like like how it is to accept, what should I understand, how, how should I feel if I accept or something. If it's not like this, how it should be. Okay, so you're saying that you understand that if you had like a hard relationship with your mother as a child, and maybe it's still hard now, the, through Vedic psychology, you'll identify your samskara, but there'll be resentment. And yeah. then you're saying, okay, so now I'm supposed to like understand where it comes from, and I'm supposed to work with it, and then I'm supposed to like accept my mom, but if that's true, then how should I be? Like, wh how should I be feeling, or how should I be acting with her, or what do you mean, how should you be? Uh, yeah, uh, if, yeah, it's logical that uh, like the relationship with the mother will be good, like who, anything will maybe disturb me, that's what I think, but uh, yeah, but some resentment still, like maybe the relationship is good, but some resentment, like how she can act like this in the childhood can still be inside. So what, what is, what to do with it? Like, what should be the process? I don't know. Mm -hmm. So identifying the samskara and the feelings is the first step, which you've done, which is great. And then you have to work with the therapist to work through those feelings. You know, and once you work through them, you'll kind of they'll start reducing, nur nurturing your inner child, understanding what really happened and how it made you feel. All of that it takes time, but once that's done, then the resentment will lift, and then you'll see your mom for who she is, and you probably won't be as close with her as you are now because you're saying the relationship's good, but she's still the same person. So most likely, you will take distance and you will protect yourself from hurting you in that way again. It still will be. A relationship but it won't be the same you know what you have to digest and you have to understand okay she hurt me in these ways why do I keep exposing myself because there's old resentment and there might be new resentment coming because she keeps triggering you probably you know so it's a process you know um, but when you get to that point it, you feel better and you feel more empowered more in control and it's a very different relationship and she won't like it so even if she continue acting in some particular way it will not already trigger because you won't expose yourself to it. And you will have learned how to navigate it when she does certain things, how to distance yourself, how to not, you know, there, you know a therapist will help you work through that, and give you skills to deal with somebody like that. Does that make sense? Thank okay, you. I think Babaji is going to be here in one minute. So I'm going to end now. And if you have other questions, let's save it till next. I know there's a few more. Let's save it till next week, okay? Because we're going to keep going with Vedic psychology. So thank you guys all for being here and listening to these mm -hmm. points today. Haribo. Yeah, yeah,